Children pick these leaves out of the lawn in idle fidgeting. The plants crowd edges of streets and sidewalks. They're at your doorstep, the edges of your garden, they're in the park. The commonplace appearance of this plant has made it all but invisible. Yet, it is an abundant food, more nutritious than spinach, easier to grow than lettuce, tough as nails in any growing environment, medicinally useful, and as a non-native species, impossible to over-harvest. There's probably no wild edible more ubiquitous than the one I want to share with you today. But I guarantee, at least some of you, have no idea what it's called. Do you recognize this plant? I bet you do. I spent years of my life walking all over it without knowing what to call it, but I'll tell you now. It is the lowly, the humble, the undernoticed plantain. The members of the Plantago genus are everywhere and offer many gifts. So let's talk about how to find and identify plantain. First off, we need to clear up some terms. The low-growing herb that is the featured plant of this video is very different from the starchy tropical cooking banana that is inexplicably also called plantain. I have not been able to figure out why these disparate plants were given the same title. If anyone has a clue, please drop it off in the comments below. Plantain, the herb, is a plant that is common across Europe and Asia and used widely in the associated medical traditions of those regions. It made its way to the United States along with colonialization. It's not clear if it was planted intentionally or carried along in the droppings of livestock that were also lugged across the pond, but once it arrived, it was here to stay. Several Native American nations named this newfound plant White Man's Footprint in a testament to its ubiquity. In the modern day, finding plantain is a cinch. It has spread across the United States in their entirety, growing from East Coast to west coast and from the frosty north all the way to the humid south. Needless to say, you can't over harvest it. It grows readily in any disturbed soil it can find, and it isn't picky about location or soil compaction either. Jade, sun, fluffy loam, hard packed clay, plantain will happily set up camp and grow lush and green. You can easily find it in the garden in the spring and the summer or alongside any foot trail year round. It's an evergreen perennial too. In my zone six homestead, there are plantain rosettes scattered across the land throughout all of winter. I don't disturb them then though. They're not actively growing. They'll provide a lot better harvest once spring weather gives them the go ahead to grow again. There are two main species of plantain that you're likely to encounter. Probably the most common and widespread is Plantago major or broadleaf plantain. It bears broad, leathery-feeling leaves that grow in basil rosettes. They are simple, untoothed, and can vary widely in size, from an inch long and wide to leaves bigger than my hand. Notably for members of this genus, the veins in the leaves are parallel. At the base of the petiole, there is often a wine-red color that fades to green by the time it gets to the leaf proper. And notably, the leaves and stems are aligned with distinctive white string-like veins that stretch when the leaf tissue is ripped apart. This is a great identification feature. From April to November, the flowers grow in an underwhelming nubbly green spike that shoots out from the center of the rosette. They're commonly more seen as a symptom of an unmown lawn rather than a flower in their own right. The other variety we're going to talk about is English plantain, Plantago lanceolata. Sometimes called English plantain, ribwort plantain, or narrow leaf plantain, grows in the same regions and with the same tenacity as broadleaf. On my land, the two species grow side by side, spoiling me for choice for the best leaves. Like broadleaf plantain, they grow as a basal rosette of leaves. Also similar are those distinctive parallel veins and long petioles. Unlike broadleaf plantain, English plantain is a bit hairy in both appearance and texture. English plantain flowers are different than broadleaf plantain as well. They grow at the end of a long green flower stalk topped with a brownish cotton swab-like head and ringed about with tiny white flowerets that bloom from April to October. They're easy to overlook, but when viewed up close, I contend they have their own subtle beauty. Let's talk about some plantain look-alikes now. If you're new to foraging and have only begun building up your knowledge of plants and their traits, it is possible that you could confuse plantain leaves with a different species of domesticated lily. Most lilies are toxic and should not be consumed. And plantain does have a passing resemblance to them. Lilies notably lack those fibrous strings that are so distinctive to the Plantago genus, but a novice might not be aware of that. So as I have said many times, and as I have said in our ground rules for foraging safely video, if you don't have complete confidence in a plant's identity, you're not ready to eat it yet. So if you feel that you don't have a good grasp of identifying plantain by the leaf alone this season, wait until the plants bloom. The underwhelming blossoms are a surefire way to distinguish plantain from any of the showy blossoms of the lily family. Take plantain's long growing season to get to know it and identify it in many settings, and then you'll be able to harvest it at any point from that point on. So let's talk about harvesting plantain. 
As you've already read, plantain has a knack for growing where little else wants to grow. It can often be found at the edges of sidewalks, paths, bike trails, and pretty much anywhere that feet have trodden the earth hard. As such, plantain is often growing in places that are awash with the toxins, pollutants, and poisons that we humans tend to leave on the ground in our high traffic areas. When you go out to harvest plantain, you should steer clear of the plants growing directly alongside high traffic urban areas. It's just too likely for them to be contaminated. Far safer to pluck the perfect leaves rising freely in your backyard or in an abandoned field. Flea beetles and their relatives also like to nibble tiny holes in plantain leaves through the summer. It doesn't affect the quality of the leaves if there's just a few holes, but some older leaves might be positively Swiss cheesed. Thankfully, it's such a prolific grower that you can still get fresh leaves from the center of the rosette in such cases. Now, all that said, once you find good plants to pick, that shouldn't be hard, you'll have a wide array of kitchen possibilities that open up to you. Let's head to the kitchen and have some fun. Let's talk about cooking and using plantain. You can eat plantain as freely as you would spinach or kale, with many of the same health benefits. Flavor-wise, it's mild, not bitter, green and vegetal, and somewhat unobtrusive to the palate. Some foraging books say that the young leaves have a lemony flavor, but I have never experienced this. If you expect the same bright, tang of a wood sorrel leaf than when you chomp on a young plantain leaf, you will be disappointed. Likewise, a plate of boiled, unseasoned plantain leaves won't wow anybody at the dinner table. But instead of seeing this as a detriment, think of the greens as a healthy, blank palate to spice up at your whim. If you're a fan of green juices or green smoothies, plantain is happy to become the cost-effective alternative to your pricey organic kale or wheatgrass. Just blend it or juice it and mix it with fruit juice as you would other greens and enjoy the health benefits. Plantain leaves taste good sauteed like kale or spinach, but they do turn a somewhat drab olive green color when heated. Blend them with other greens or bright red peppers and the dish will look livelier. Many wild food cookbooks will say that you should only use the young leaves because they're more tender, but honestly, I don't listen to that. Instead, I pick leaves of all sizes and shapes and development. If you cut off the tough wine-colored stem and then slice those leaves perpendicular to those thread-filled veins, they all are easy enough to chew. Now, if you'd like a whole article worth of ideas on how to use plantain leaves, head on over to our earlier article on some inspiring ways to use wild greens. Plantain fits perfectly into any of the recipes I've listed there. But for a particularly plantain perfect preparation, however, I have one more idea. Plantain leaves make an absolutely excellent kale, well, plantain chip. I prefer them 100% to kale chips, as their veiny structure becomes a boon rather than a detriment during the cooking process. It helps hold the leaves together. Plantain chips are melt-in-your-mouth crispy once completely cooked, and leaves of any size can be used. There's an easy recipe online here at the link in the description box below, but honestly, any kale chip recipe works. Finally, plantain can be dried and used as a base for a wild tea as well. On its own, it's a little vegetable tasting, but when combined with red clover blossoms, blackberry leaf, and wild bergamot, it is particularly nice and offers balance. We'll have a full video on wild tea blends coming up soon, so keep an eye out for that. I also want to share some medicinal uses of plantain. Though we are largely ignorant of plantain's identity nowadays, it wasn't always that way. About four generations back, it was well known as an e healing herb in the United States. But you can go even further back and find it mentioned as a healing plant in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's Act 1, Scene 2 for those interested. Now before I go on, I suppose I'll have to emphasize that, as with all online health advice, take my recommendations for what they are. Tips from a stranger. You need to do research for yourself before depending on them. All the same, there are some notable uses for plantain that make it a bit of an on-the-go medicine chest for those who know how to use it. For stomach issues, many folks have actually consumed plantain weed as an OTC treatment, but have no idea that they've done it. The main ingredient in Metamucil is actually the seed of a culted variety of plantain, P. Pacillium. The seeds of any plantain, however, can be used for the mucilaginous and mildly laxative properties. Strangely enough, a tea made from the leaves is astringent as an, and has the opposite effect. It was used in the past as a mild antidiarrheal. Now, aside from stirring the seeds into orange juice, probably the most common first aid use of plantain is as a field poultice for insect steam. If you've run into the unfriendly end of a wasp, yellow jacket, or bee, plantain is probably waiting at your feet, ready to offer up its leaves and some relief. Merely find two clean leaves, chew one into a gooey mess, spit it out on the other leaf, and apply it to the sting for relief. You would be surprised how much ouch this spit poultice can soothe. I imagine this is due to plantain's ability to draw out material when applied to the skin. Herbalists have even used it to draw the infection out of a wound, venom from a bite, or even splinters from deep within the skin. Old plant names often give clues to how they were historically used, and how they might still be used today. Plantain was once referred to as soldier's herb, a nod to its past use as a wound treatment on the battlefield. The Omaha Indian nation was known to crush the leaves in oil and apply the mixture to wounds to prevent scarring. You can also make an ointment in a similar tradition by infusing plantain leaves in oil and 
blending your own healing self. We got a whole article on that process over on Insteading as well if you're interested. Now with all that I've shared, I hope that I've given you a good introduction to this under-noticed plant, as well as cultivate a desire to get to know it better, from herbalist Rosemary Gladstar. For anything to be this common, nutritious, safe, and effective, not to mention free for the picking, it truly is a gift to humankind. If plantain put on a fancy name, donned an exotic blossom, and hailed from anywhere else other than our own backyards and empty fields, we'd call it a superfood, extol its virtues, and put a hefty price tag on it. So I hope when you see this weed springing up around you this spring, you're able to greet it as a friend and aid and not as an annoyance. I'll be out there with you picking, drying, and eating plantain with gusto and gratefulness.